Uh, yes, I'm going to be talking about um, two things, like you said. Um, I'm starting with the demo and demo effects on the Acorn Electron. I guess some of you may know me uh, from Twitter, maybe, or from YouTube, um, from the forum, the startup forum. And uh, like I said in my introduction, I'm an Electron lover. Um, I still have my childhood Electron next to me right here. And, uh, but I've since collected about five more. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, but uh, maybe sell them on later. Um, yeah, so this is um, actually my precious, my uh, original Acon Electron. I didn't have the plus one or the disk interface or even the disk drive back in the day. Uh, certainly not the screen, of course. But I did play Elite on the Electron and um, yeah, it's still my original Electron. And this is the one I, I don't store it away uh, somewhere. I use it every day. I code on it every day. I just want to, uh, to use it. Um, and the other ones are for spare, spare uh, backup uh, machines, right? So here, um, yeah, I'm a man on a mission. That's what I, it's like big words, but uh, I'm a man on a mission. And my mission is to show the world that the humble Acorn Electron can do much more than you probably no, or maybe even expected. And this is uh, being, has, has been fun for me uh, since a child because um, my 12 year old self would probably be surprised by the things that I make right now. Um, and I'm trying to show the world, okay, uh, maybe you didn't expect it, but the electron can do much more than you think, even a standard electron with any additions. So and, uh, what I'm doing is, okay, maybe I see uh, the latest demo from uh, uh, the bit shifters, or I see some cool Amiga demo or a game or whatever. And I'm thinking, uh, not like, uh, oh, this is never possible on the Electron. I'm thinking, I'm challenging myself. How could I possibly make this work on the Electron? So, and then my mind starts working. Um, I need to have speed, I need to have enough RAM uh, with all the constraints, how can I make it work? And this is continuously driving me to make new things actually. And this is my current hobby actually, or midlife crisis, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm, I like to call it the battle of cycles and bytes for short. And um, yeah, so what am I up against? The Electron, uh, most of you will probably know. Uh, I'm doing, doing a quick rundown of the Electron, of course the 6502. And we have the famous ULA. And I'm pretty sure that Phil will be talking about that uh, this evening a little bit more and also the uh, replacement ULA. Um, but we have no other cool chips like the CRTC or video ULA or sound chip or whatever, like the beep. So we have to make do with just the uh, functionality of the ULA in the Electron. And of course we have third, 32 kilobytes of RAM, no sideways RAM, standard. Um, and this is always a problem. We have uh, slow RAM in the Electron and we have also RAM contention between the ULA and the CPU in the high bandwidth modes, zero to three. So if you run a game, and I will be talking about it later, Mountain Panic by Dave Footed on the BBC, it runs in mode two and it's fast enough on the BBC, but it's awfully slow on the Electron. So how do you make it work? I'll be talking about that later. But this is what, uh, what we're up against on the Electron. And so it's a challenge for me, of course. So there's no Mode 7, no Teletext uh, uh, shenanigans, unfortunately. And we have only a very loud and simple beeper, single channel, no uh, real white noise. You can make it do white noise and even one bit sound if you want. Uh, but there's no volume control, uh, so it's very simple. But uh, I will show you later that we can still get a little bit of, of a tune out of it, or at least Simon uh, was able to do that. And we have no, uh, unfortunately, we have no hardware timers or anything like that. We have a few simple interrupts and uh, no real way of measuring time or uh, getting um, a real specific interrupts uh, generated by a timer, for instance. So this is the constant battle of cycles and bytes. I would like to show you also the tool chain I use for my 6502 coding. Very um, short, shortly. Um, this is, of course, the virtual studio code that I use. And you can see I'm using um, syntax highlighting. And this is done by the uh, excellent BPSC by Simon also. 
and I highly recommend it. And of course, I use the excellent Beep ASM to uh, assemble the 6502 code. And um, this is pretty small on the screen, but it's my own Acorn Electron emulator. And like a true programmer, it has a built-in debugger and lots of small uh, digits and everything on the screen, like the memory map and all the registers, et cetera, et cetera. I use that. It only has tape support so far, uh, but I use this to debug everything that I make, if I can. Uh, and it's uh, actually, honestly, it's one of the um, least accurate emulates around, but okay, it doesn't bother me. It was pretty cool to make it. Okay, so uh, this is uh, moving on to the first and uh, one and only full demo I ever made for the Electron. Because it's, uh, as Kieran may probably know, it takes a lot of stamina to actually uh, complete a full demo. That's why I usually create demo effects, short and sweet and easy to, well, not easy, but fun to make and you can move on to something else. Uh, but I'm thinking I want to create a full demo and that's the bad Apple demo. I'm pretty sure everybody knows the bad Apple demo. It has been featured and created on many 8-bit computers, uh, of course, also the BBC. And uh, this is the part where I have to introduce Inverse Face and Simon also, uh, because they are responsible for the excellent music in this Electron version. I'm going to try to show you full screen video with sound. Um, somebody stop me if it's not okay with the video and everything. Here we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm going to stop it here because there is still an uh, outro going on, but it takes some time. Um, so I'm pretty uh, uh, proud of this demo because first of all, it's complete demo. <laughs> it's uh, not officially released, but of course you may find it on uh, startup and on Twitter and everything. And I'm also uh, really excited by the, yeah, maybe for beat fans, it's not much, but the sound, the music, the tune from this thing created by Simon is really excellent. And this is as far as you can get, I think on the Electron. I've never heard a game or a demo with this kind of uh, music before. So that's pretty cool. Um, I'm talking a little bit about making the demo. And um, on the right, you can see um, one of my earlier versions. I'm actually creating what we call a Delta frame um, file, which is a large file, uh, which, um, how do you say, that stores the difference between the previous frame of video and the current frame of video. And as you can see, there's a lot of white, if there's a lot of difference between the previous frame and the next frame, and there's a lot of black if there's not a lot of difference. Uh, and what you want to do is to encode the difference, not the frames itself, but you want to encode the difference between the frames. And, but you have to start with a source. I'm not looking at any demo, uh, existing demo, whatever, but I found, I tried to find the cleanest YouTube video I could find. I think it was a Spectrum 128K version of the demo. Um, and yeah, I borrowed that from the YouTube and I separated into uh, about 5,000 frames of that resolution you can see. And I removed all duplicates. I cleaned up a lot of frames and <clears throat> already thinking ahead, the electron will have a tough job displaying this. I removed some of the heavy Delta frames. So a lot of white means a lot of change and it will uh, struggle to keep up. So I removed a lot of heavy Delta frames and I've also downscaled the image a little bit to 192 by 144. And the final version has about, no, not about, exactly 1,712 frames, which also has, has to match with the music, of course, uh, you can understand. And uh, you can see I cut a few corners in the video I just showed because uh, the screen is smaller, 192, 144. Uh, it's in mode four, screen mode four, actually. And um, I also figured I could, I could make it look cool and make it run faster if I just skipped every odd scan line. So this is what I did. And um, I went on with a tool to generate the RLE run length encoded delta frames. I wrote this tool in uh, yeah, on my computer in Windows in C, uh, my other favorite language. And um, I tried many RLE schemes. Uh, you probably know there's different things you can do. And I have very complex ones like skip a uh, number of scan lines, scan lines, jump to a different location on the screen or whatever. Uh, but I settled on a very simple scheme, which turns out uh, to work the best uh, for this. And this is the encoding. If you, um, there's a byte stream, it's about 700K. Uh, it's on multiple disks, virtual disks. And if you uh, find a zero, that means uh, you found the end of the frame. If you find a zero and then seven uh, bits, it means you have to flip a few pixels because there was change uh, in the screen. If you find a one and a few zeros, that means you have to change the cycle, uh, the frame pacing, I mean, you have to cycle the frame pacing and we'll talk about it later. And the other uh, encoding is, okay, I have to skip a number of pixels. And of course, you're hoping to find a lot of these bytes because if you skip the pixels, you can draw faster. Um, Syncing video and audio is really a pain in the, well, you know what? And um, actually, because I cannot guarantee like whatever, uh, 10, 25, certainly not 50 frames per second, I had to find a way to synchronize the video and the audio. And the way I did it was like, yeah, like a hack job. Uh, I just encoded a few special bytes, the cycle frame pacing bytes into the stream itself. And if you encounter those bytes, you either uh, run, the video a little bit faster or a little bit slower, depending on what byte you find. Um, and it's just like experimenting, okay, can I keep up with the audio? Does it match with the video I'm seeing? And do we end at the same time uh, after a few minutes? So this is what you saw in the video before. And I, like I said, it's 668 kilobytes of data. And I didn't try to make it any smaller because I could just spread it out over four disk images. I'm, I'm running this actually on the ELK SD, 
which is an um, SD card solution with MMFS. And you can uh, mount four virtual disks and uh, well, you have 800 kilobytes of data if you want. And that's what I did. And uh, like I said, it's mode four. And if you measure, it's about eight to 10 frames per second. And uh, it's acceptable, I think. So some other tech info. Um, like I said, you have to flip or skip a lot of pixels. Uh, the whole frame that you see every time, you have to scan that all the time. You have to flip uh, or even skip. Lots of pixels. And I was thinking in the beginning, okay, this is going to be slow, but actually the drawing of the screen is not the bottleneck. The speed of the ELK SD, uh, which is about uh, the same as DFS, is about four or five kilobytes per second. That's actually the bottleneck because since then I have tested uh, faster solutions and they can uh, run the demo maybe twice as fast. So this is immediately making me think I want to make a version two of the demo. Um, I'm using uh, maybe some of you who saw the um, uh, talk by Kieran last time will recognize this. I'm also using a circular buffer for the Delta stream. It's four kilobytes. Another 10 kilobyte is uh, um, occupied by the excellent music by Simon. And it's played back by poking the uh, Sheila register in the electron uh, directly. I'm not using the operating system, of course, for that. And it's poked at 50 hertz. So that's the music you hear. And another 10 kilobytes, so we're already at 24 kilobytes, is for mode four. There's no room for double buffering, and it's not really necessary either. Uh, and so you have a few kilobytes left for the actual machine code. And I'm reading, of course, with a raw sector read. And I found that reading two sectors at a time, 512 bytes, is the optimum speed for this configuration. And I also found this uh, probably unlike DFS, that MMFS, the one I'm using at least, uh, seems to re-enable interrupts during a OS word call. Um, but I, I forgot the details about that. And I'm already thinking about version number two. And I've got the um, excellent Exomizer Deepacker by Kieran, at least his uh, implementation on the Deep. And I'm thinking about using that to compress the data much further. I also um, got the ELK SD revision 2 yesterday in the mail. And I've got a um, prototype NGC Mark II from uh, Dave, Dave Hitchens, which both of these are much faster than the current SD card solution I have. And I can't wait to try that Apple version number two on these. So maybe I can get rid of the raster effect. I can do a full frame in mode four. And uh, I'm also triggered by Scary Beasts, uh, Chris, uh, with asynchronous raw disk reading. And maybe that will speed up the reading instead of reading um, yeah, two sectors at a time. So lots of ideas for version number two and other streaming demos, by the way. So okay, I'm moving on. I'm looking at the time here. Uh, second, uh, this is not a full demo. This is a demo effect. I create a lot of demo effects because they're short and sweet, and uh, I just enjoy getting the most out of the electron. And this is the basketball, bouncing basketball demo. There's no sound. I'm just going to show you the full screen video here. And like, it's, uh, like I said, it's a bouncing basketball. It's a large sprite. And just because I could, I uh, also displayed a few rainbow uh, color cycling bars. And just to show what is possible, this is mode one, screen mode one, also extremely slow on the electron, but uh, I just wanted to show I can still manage to show something impressive uh, on the electron using mode one and lots of colors. So here we go, I'm skipping that. Um, so I'm talking about that uh, and I'm sh sharing a few tips and tricks I found along the way. Um, yeah, inspiration. Um, it can happen anytime. Uh, you watch a demo. I watched the game in this case, Firetrack, well known probably. Um, and one of the few games on the Electron that actually has smooth vertical scrolling. And it moves at two scan lines at a time in mode five. And I was, of course, I was impressed by that. Uh, I didn't actually look at the code, but I'm immediately thinking how on earth is that possible? And how can I use that for myself? And the idea was, okay, oh, I don't want to use mode five, I want to use a slow mode, slow mode one. And I want to move a large sprite, it's turned out to be a basketball. I want to move that smoothly on the screen, on the electron. Now, 
some people will call you crazy. I'm thinking, how can I possibly do that on the electron? So here's a few tips for coding fast effects, especially if you're aiming for 50 frames per second. Don't move too many bytes around because it takes a lot of cycles. You don't want to do that, especially in mode one, the slow mode. Uh, don't calculate too much real time, if possible at all. Um, and don't rely on the operating system or basic or whatever. Uh, just kick them out and uh, take control of the machine yourself. That's what I do. And do, of course, you have a lot of things you uh, may want to do. That's use on world loops, self-modifying code, cycle counting. You just have to be really critical about your own code. Uh, is it fast enough? Is it aligned? Uh, do we introduce extra cycles that we don't want? Now, Kieran talked about it uh, at length on the BBC. It's the same thing. Um, and what you want to do is, uh, of course, you want to read some keys or you want to make some sound or whatever. So I just poke the Sheila register yourself or you read uh, the keyboard from, uh, from the hardware directly and you roll your own IRQ handler and don't rely on the operating system because it slows down the electron. And uh, of course, if you don't want to think in moving bytes, you want to think in, uh, in uh, illusion. So changing colors, uh, palette switching, uh, using all available memory. Um, if you do that correctly, you, you, can, uh, you have to reserve a few bytes in memory, but you can use all the other bytes if you want. And I'm pretty sure Dave Footed uh, uh, of Mountain Panic fame knows exactly what I mean, because he uses every available byte uh, in his game. I will talk about it later. Uh, what you want to do is use tables. And if you cannot use tables, use tables or tables. Because my motto is uh, pre-calculated is good. Uh, Real-time calculation is usually bad, for speed at least. And if you want to do some magic, you can change the screen's start address, also poking Sheila, of course, and uh, changing screen mode. And I've made a few demo effects where you just switch screen mode, mid-scan line or mid-screen or any combination of that. And you can do interesting things. Not as interesting as the BBC with the CRTC, but still, I want to squeeze out everything I can from the electron. So here we go. Um, I'm talking about slow modes, uh, mode zero to three. Why is it slow? Because we, the ULA and the CPU are fighting for cycles. And actually, if you measure that, 62.5% uh, to be precise, that's 40 cycles, that, that's the visible part of each scan line in these screen modes. Uh, you don't have any CPU at all, it's just, the ULA uh, pushing the bytes to the screen to display whatever is in video memory. So you only have about 20, no, exactly 24 cycles during H sync uh, to do anything useful in that scan line. So that's awful, really. Um, and the electron has an, as far as I know, an always on interlaced PAL image. Uh, and it also has different timing between even and odd fields. That's what I found out. Well, the hard way, of course. And um, the solution is also uh, there. You have, just have to use, that sounds very easy, you have to use a stable raster. And on the right, you can see two effects that are actually possible if you have a stable raster and you are able to do at every given cycle on the screen whatever you want. So in this case, changing the palette many, many, many times during the screen. And these effects are actually run at 50 frames per second on the humble Acolor Electron. Uh, and I've made a few of those also. Um, okay, so how do you get the stable rest on the Electron? That was quite an achievement and quite a challenge for myself. And of course, um, of, not, not, not of course, I mean, um, I'm, I'm lucky to find uh, the right way to do that. What I did, um, in short, you measure the time between the display end interrupt, which happens 50 times per second, and the real-time clock interrupt, also 50 times per second, which combined uh, uh, make the 100 hertz timer, incidentally, on the electron. Uh, and why do we measure it? Because there's a difference between uh, these two interrupts in the even field and the odd field of the PAL frame. So if you measure that, you know which one is shorter, slightly, and then the other one. And you know in which PAL field you are actually in at the moment. And I don't even care if it's the odd field or the even field, I just want to start my demo in the same PAL field every time I start it. Otherwise you get 
yeah, um, problems. And then if that's uh, done, you hunt for the intrat edge of the display end, the vertical sync sometimes it's called, uh, because you want to be in perfect cycle sync of that interrupt, because after that, you just want to count 40,000 cycles for each PAL frame, both fields together. So that's what I do. You hunt for the interrupt edge, um, pulling the um, uh, Sheila register to find the interrupt. And after that, I disable all interrupts because they are not even uh, wanted anymore. They are unnecessary. They just interrupt your execution flow. And this is where the real pain in the rear starts because you have to be 100% cycle counting from this point on. Uh, one cycle off and your whole demo stable raster collapses, which is why I found many times. And because that's because every path of execution has to take exactly the same amount of cycles. And I think Kieran showed some of these examples on the forum recently. And I know exactly what he's talking about. And also RAM access, don't uh, cross boundary, page boundaries uh, or uh, branch across page boundaries because you will introduce extra unwanted cycles. So you have to code very carefully and yeah, um, it doesn't become much fun after a while, but it makes some things possible that otherwise are impossible or very difficult. So some uh, additional tricks in the basketball demo. Uh, you may have guessed I didn't move a single byte of screen memory. I didn't change a single byte of screen memory. It's all an illusion. Um, actually, if you happen upon vertical sync, which is not an interrupt anymore, it's just cycle counted. Uh, you know vertical sync starts, you switch to mode four. It gives you more speed. And uh, it's generally a good idea if you are making games or demos. So that's what I do. You switch to a low bandwidth uh, screen mode. And at, when you reach the top of the screen and you know exactly where it is because you're still counting the cycles, you select a screen start address from a table, uh, carefully select the table, which was also an experiment to find that. And uh, at the top of the screen, I skip 0, 10, 20, or 30, mode six scan line. So I switch to mode six, and I have to skip a few uh, scan lines. Uh, and the trick here is, um, as you may know, mode three, mode six, also on the BBC, also on the Electron, they have a two scan line gap between each character row. And this is the trick we are exploiting. Um, I found if I skipped a number of mode six scan lines, and uh, after that I switched to mode one, which is the visible part, the basketball, um, then the screen is displaced by a few scan lines, which is uh, at a, a better granular granularity than eight scan lines. The granularity becomes two scan lines. So this is what uh, also Firetrack uses, I think, I hope, uh, to scroll two scan lines at a time. So this is what I'm doing. I'm displacing the basketball on the screen, uh, any amount of even scan lines, actually. And uh, of course, the trickery with the rainbow bars is all palette switching, as you may have guessed, at the exact uh, horizontal sync position. And the funny thing is, if you do this, in your cycle counting, you still have many cycles left, even in mode one, which is terribly slow. As you may have guessed by now, you still have many cycles left. So you have to do a lot of cycle burning. And I've made a few macros in uh, Beep Asm. Actually, I'm burning uh, hundreds of cycles just to get to the right position on the screen. And uh, I found <clears throat> that uh, only real hardware, a real electron can cope with this kind of demo stable raster demo. Uh, but Dave, Dave Banks, he uh, made it happen also on the ELK FPGA, but start any emulator and you will find that it cannot run this demo uh, so far, uh, including my own emulator. And this is my final slide, which shows a few more of my demo effects, which I've made in the past couple of months. And well, thank you for, uh, for your attention. And of course, I'm open to remarks and Questions? I'm trying to find the chat window here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Kelvin. Uh, I, I was uh, 
um, just think to myself to uh, to paraphrase uh, Star Trek. I think you've uh, boldly gone where, where where no one has uh, uh, dared before um, <laughs> with the, with the electron. So, some uh, yeah. some some amazing effects that, that you've accomplished there, and and um, mad tricks. Uh, so, so that's great. So, yeah, um, I think. Well, I think. I see a question here, but I think you kind of answered it um, on the chat. Uh, so the rain, the rainbows are cool, and how do you get the ball to, to do that? I think you're, you're saying you're using um, palette switching for the for the um, for the sort of rainbow lines uh, over the top yes. of the ball. Yes, uh, I will quickly explain. Uh, like I said, I cannot see the chat window, so if you have a question there, please uh, uh, repeat it to me. Um, with the the rainbow uh, the rainbow bars the um, the one behind the basketball that's actually I have to think about it uh, that's actually changing all four colors. Uh, am I saying that correctly? No, I'm not saying that correctly. It's only changing the black color. So um, at the end of the scan line, you change the black color, and the other three colors are used in the ball. So that appears on top of the uh, rainbow bar. And the one in front is actually changing all four colors at the same time. So it appears to be in front of the basketball. That's the illusion. OK. Um, any questions, um, anyone out there? <laughs> no question, but wow. But do you, could I ask what your next project is? What, um, how are you going to push it even further? Yeah, I'm constantly uh, asking myself, but I've, I always find new things to make. Uh, you can see the, um, very small on the screen right now, the 3D earth rotating. Um, yeah, uh, some screen white effects or uh, some things in BBC Basic or it's always something new, and um, my latest venture has been uh, I'm trying to write a compiler uh, for a like a fantasy language. I just think it's cool to have my own programming language, which produces uh, 6502 assembly that will actually run on the Electron or the BBC. Uh, so I'm always finding new things, and I'm always sharing these things on Twitter, uh, more than I'm sharing probably on Startup. Uh, so if you want to keep up, just follow me on Twitter if you want. Okay. It, can I, sorry, could I ask one more question? Sure. sure. Go on. You, you go it, first. <laughs> no, sorry, no. just one more question. Is it possible to get to simulate multi-channel sound on the Electron, even though you've got only one channel somehow? Well, I'm not a sound <laughs> expert, but um, as far as I know, the uh, the tune that you hear, heard in the Bad Apple demo is about as far as it, as you can push the uh, simple beeper on the Electron. And that's all due to uh, Simon making that tune, converting that tune. And I have been able to create a little bit like a one-bit um, digital analog converter, sound, speech kind of thing. But it takes a lot of memory and a lot of processing power. So yeah, I'm not sure what else can be done, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, was it? Sorry, what I was going to say was that I don't typically have a question, but you're doing a fantastic job on Mountain Panic. So a round of applause there from me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the, in the chat uh, window. Um, uh, Bill Carr 2005 is asking, would it be easy enough to convert any of the excellent demo effects to work on the BBC? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Actually, I did make a few, how do you say that, cross-platform demos that will uh, automatically detect the host and then, well, change a few things like palette switching, sound, and that kind of thing. Um, but I tend to push the Electron as far as it can go, the ULA, so specific Sheila registers, and not all of them are possible, I think, on the BBC. Um, and actually, that's something for a different talk, but the palette registers of the Electron are very different from the BBC. So that's a, a, a bonus because sometimes you can change four colors by only writing two registers instead of, no, a lot of more uh, registers. So it saves a little, a little bit of time and you could do things uh, during scan lines that you couldn't, maybe couldn't do on the BBC, I don't know. 
but um, mainly I think all of them should be able to uh, be ported to the BBC. But yeah, like I said, my focus on the electron. So that's, uh, yeah, that's my, uh, my thing. Um, I'll, I'll just chip in with another question from the chat window. Um, and Kieran is asking, when are you doing another full demo? <laughs> yeah, I know he keeps pushing me to <laughs> to release uh, new demos, and he's also constantly uh, the whole bit shifter crew is constantly uh, in inspiration to me because I cannot hope to uh, reach that level uh, anytime soon. But it takes a lot of time to create a full demo. Um, yeah, but I have a lot of demo effects, and I could possibly um, yeah make something coherent from these demo effects. And my weakest point is I'm not musical at all. And I, I can write a music player like I did with the Bad Apple, but I cannot make the music. So I'm relying on people like Simon to do that for me. Um, yeah, probably. Uh, I will release something in the future, probably. Yeah. Kira, it's a promise. Yeah. There you go. And, and Kieran said you can find someone to help you there with, with the music, I think. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, any other questions from anyone? Not hearing many. Um, I'll I'll uh, um, uh, fire a question over. So, um, as I said earlier, you've you've gone. Uh, you, you've uh, boldly gone where no one has gone before with with, with the. Uh, electron and that, that's kind of you said at the start that's your that's your mission um <laughs> oh, <yeah>. so <laughs> so so um like uh I, I suppose we could ask this of anyone who is keen on uh retro computing and 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 coding and and hardware projects from um what what's pushing you with with the electron in particular what you know you, you know that that um in the acon world there are other machines with um sort of more uh, well, basically, more features, more more hardware yeah. to help you out. What what yeah. pushes you to the the electron? Oh, the answer is very simple. Uh, I know, of course, the BBC is more capable, the master is more capable, uh, but it also feels a little bit like cheating to me because the electron is my childhood computer. Like I said, uh, it's it's of course I know it's it's got uh, uh, really uh, limited technical capabilities but it's pushing me to find new ways to do things and it's mainly a nostalgic thing to me uh, i wish that the 12 year 13 year old me could make these things and i was in awe of people creating uh, really cool games back in the day and i had no idea uh, how to make them uh, i was dabbling a little bit in 6502 code but my understanding since writing an emulator and of course i'm a bit older now uh, reading all the uh, information on the internet that we didn't have back in the day, all the cool people on the forum, etc. So everything is available. I'm just putting it together and creating new things that really push the electron. And uh, it's just cool to see my actual childhood computer churning out these things that were uh, thought to be impossible. Yeah. And I saw a question about um, a standard electron. Yes, all of the demos are running on a standard electron. There's no extra memory. Um, some of, you know, usually I'm testing them um, of a MMFS SD card system, but you could also put them on tape. You could put them on a disk image, a BFS uh, disk drive. Uh, it's all possible. I don't want to use additional hardware, speed ups, turbo, whatever. I want to use the standard Electron. Okay. Yes. Uh, th th thank you for uh, for that. Um, we have another question from uh, Bill Carr, 2005, saying, uh, do you have any plans to release your emulator? Ah, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, I've been asked that many times before. Um, I'm a bit apprehensive about it because, yeah, as a programmer, it's never perfect. And like I said, I only have got tape support. There's no disk support whatsoever, no ROM support. Um, it feels very unfinished. Um, it's, it is actually on GitHub, but it's in a private repository, uh, and I'm not working on it right now. But maybe, maybe if I'm confident enough, I will be releasing it uh, in the future. Yeah, maybe. 
Yeah, I just wondered how much uh, experience does he have of 6502 programming? How long has it taken him to build up to the level where he's creating what he's creating now? Ooh, Simon, that's a good question, yeah. <laughs> uh, I still remember um, thumbing through my uh, advanced Electron user guide back in the day when I was a teenager. And uh, I couldn't really understand many of the opcodes. Uh, I was typing some things from Electron user or I don't remember, um, just trying to make machine code work, it didn't work. And of course, since then, I did work in IT as a programmer for some time. I'm not doing that anymore, but I did do that in my younger years. And I was programming in ARM and in, uh, uh, of course, Intel uh, machine code, everything like that. And when I came back to 6502, maybe one or two years ago, it just, it, it made sense to me. So it took, I don't know, only a couple of days to get back into the, um, the whole flow and just created small things, created larger things, created a full demo, created more demo effects. Uh, of course, we have all kinds of cool things, uh, tools like assemblers and IDEs and uh, whatever uh, that we didn't have back in the day. So yeah, that's, that's a very interesting journey, but um, yeah, I, I didn't really understand 6502 back in the day, to be honest.